Um, okay, um, this is the question 15. Uh, it says, you know, diesel engine. If you don't know anything about diesel engine, not a problem. Sometimes question gives you, again, extra information to try to throw you off. So here, what I'm hoping for is that I don't know, I don't need to know anything about diesel cycle to answer this. The fuel is ignited without a spark plug. Again, extraneous information. Instead, air in a cylinder is compressed adiabatically to a temperature above the ignition temperature of the fuel. At the point of maximum compression, the fuel is injected into the cylinder. This entire first couple sentences are extraneous for the purpose of the question. I mean, you know, it's a useful background, but you didn't need it. No. Suppose that air at 19 degrees C, that sounds like something I need to know, initial temperature, is taken into the cylinder at a volume. Oh, wait, uh, I'm using the labels one and two. So let me use the same labels here, T1. And then compress the adiabatically and quasi-statically to a temperature of 530 degrees C. And a volume to V2. If gamma is equal to 1.4, air is mostly diatomic. What is the ratio V1 over V2? And hint, just as a reminder, links you to the relevant section of the textbook. And I think the textbook might even um, derive the temperature volume relationship for adiabatic processes. Um, at least I saw it do that for a later chapter. So it might be doing that. Let me just scroll down to see. Um, yeah, <laughs> it actually does do that. Um, well, I mean, you know, it, it's a simple enough derivation. Starting from this, you use the ideal gas law to um, replace the pressure with the volume. And when you do that, you find this. Um, yeah, maybe it didn't do it completely. You know, let me do that derivation starting from this, because I do want you to memorize as few formulas as possible. So let's say you just have that memorized. So I'll start from there. So the question tells you that it's a adiabatic compression. So knowing that it's adiabatic compression, you should, uh, from memory, you should remember that this relationship applies, that pressure times volume raised to factor gamma is some constant value. Um, I don't ever give you what this value is, because frankly, this presence of the factor gamma makes the units crazy. It's units that have lots of square roots and whatever in it. So I just want to say it's constant. <laughs> I don't want to ever specify that physical quantity because the units are unwieldy. Uh, this question is a little bit easier in that they actually gave you gamma. Uh, they could have told you that, assume that gas is diatomic and leave it to you, figure out then gamma must be five over, no, sorry, not five over. Leave it to you to figure out that gamma must be seven over five. That's fine, you should be able to do that. But this question actually gave you what gamma should be, so it makes it a little bit easier for you. So, so this is the expression that you are able to start out with, knowing that the process is adiabatic. You can say that P1, V1 raised to gamma is equal to P2, V2 raised to gamma. And when I write down an equation, which I'm going to use to solve a problem, I like to look for uh, my knowns and unknowns. And as you look at this expression, you should realize, oh, I don't know any of these quantities. So I have four unknowns. <laughs> now, I am asked for V1 over V2. So I have some hope, especially because V1 and V2 are raised to the same power, that these particular two unknowns can be reduced to only one unknown that I'm going to solve for. So if you have that hope in algebra, then what you really have two extra unknowns, these two pressures. So what that means in terms of kind of general problem solving strategy is that you have to identify two additional equations 
um, two additional pieces of information. And in this kind of problem solving, information is almost always presented in a form of an equation. So you need to find two equations to get rid of these two unknowns. And those two equations are the ideal guess law. So using ideal guess law, this is what I can write down. P1 V1 is equal to some number of uh, some molecules, another unknown. I'm hoping it'll cancel out. Boltzmann constant times T1. P2 V2 is equal to number of molecules times Boltzmann constant times T2. And here, I hope is that um, the reason this equation fits with my hope is because these temperatures which are involved in these equations are known or given quantities. So, so, um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, most of you probably know where to go once you have this much. And let me just model something that I like to do. I really prefer systematic pre problem solving over clever problem solving. So a type of clever problem solving I can do is I can actually, so <laughs> let me show you something that I will immediately say I'm not going to do. Uh, what I can do as a matter of clever problem solving is I can rewrite this into this form. I can factor out a factor of V1. By doing that, I can do, write down P1 V1 times V1 raised to the power of gamma minus one is equal to, you know, it's equal to that. And I have P1 V1 here, I have P1 V1 here. I can substitute it in and kind of in one step get to the formula that I'm trying to get to. And um, there are circumstances where that kind of rearranging of term is uh, useful for you to know how to do. And so I'm not discounting the kind of clever problem solving entirely. But <laughs> um, I want you to know how to approach problems systematically first, because um, as much satisfaction as there is in clever problem solving is that it's, you know, it's kind of like having bag of tricks versus having a toolbox. Oh, maybe they're the same metaphor. Um, at least the way I like to think of toolbox is that um, they are standard tools. Being standard, you can apply it to almost anything. But when you only have bag of tricks, sometimes tricks work, sometimes tricks don't work. And uh, one positive thing about systematic problem solving is they almost always work. So one special type, not special, one type of problem solving that I would like to highlight as being this standard tool is it's how you approach um, any system of equations anytime you have to do some type of algebra. And the algebra, the tool that I want you to have is the tool of substitution. So here I have two unknowns, P1 and P2. And as a matter of systematic approach, what I have done is I came up with equations that represent extra additional information that'll tell me something about these unknowns. And how do you, they tell me something about those unknowns? By allowing me to solve this equation for that unknown so that I can use that solve the for expression to eliminate the unknown quantities. And that's the substitution method and it's a, you know, it's not glamorous, it's not linear combination, um, but it has the benefit of almost always working, even though sometimes it can get tedious. So let me, with that tedious explanation aside, let me solve this for P1. So P1 is equal to and KB T1 over V1 and P2 is equal to and KB T2 over V2. And with these tools in my hand, I am going to plug them into my original expression and then get what that comes to. So plugging in my expressions for P1 and P2, I get NKB T1 
over v1 times v1 raised to gamma is equal to nkbt2 over v2 times v2 raised to gamma. So I get one of the things I was hoping for, which is that n's cancel out, so I never needed to know them. Um, I do have t1 and t2, but those are my known numbers, so I can plug those in. And before I do further algebra, it is good to simplify these. That'll help me um, solve for the ratio v1 over v2. So um, simplifying that, I get this t1 times v1 raised to gamma minus 1, you know, numerator or yeah, the exponent in the numerator minus the exponent in the denominator is equal to t2 times v2 raised to gamma minus 1. Yeah, so th this was actually the formula in the textbook. So if you somehow had this memorized or looked it up in the textbook, you could have just used it, skip all this uh, five minute process, that's fine. Um, but you know, my approach minimizes the amount of information you have to memorize. So from here, you have to finish the algebra. I guess um, here what I prefer is kind of get to this expression v1 over v2 as quickly as I can. So that means putting these two together moving t1 to the other side and once you've done that you get v1 raised to power of gamma minus 1 over v2 raised to gamma power gamma minus 1 is equal to t2 over t1 and you can kind of uh, you know use the exponent algebra that hopefully you are familiar with to combine these into a single fraction raised to power of gamma minus one. And once you got this far, then you know to get the ratio of V1 over V2, you take the square root of gamma minus one, or not square root, <laughs> uh, sorry, it's kind of a very cumbersome way to describe it. Let me do it this way, raise it to a power of one over gamma minus one. Um, and you do the same thing on the right hand side, that will preserve the equality and what you end up with on the left hand side is v1 over v2. So you just need to compute this on the right hand side and that'll give you the ratio. I think I can calculate that on my um, calculator and then plug that in into my open, math, my open math page that I'm already at. So uh, while I'm plugging in the number, I'm going to take care to convert the temperatures into Kelvin temperature. So T2, 530 degrees C in Kelvins, you know, at 273, it becomes 803 Kelvin divided by T1, 19 degrees C, or at 273, that's uh, 292. So that ratio raised to the power of one over, uh, it's easier to plug in if I do gamma minus one. So 1 1.4 minus one is 0 0.4. So 1 over 0 0.4. So that should be the ratio of volumes, 12.5. Let's hope that's right. If it's not, it'll be embarrassing. If it's a typo, it'll also be embarrassing. Okay, so that's it.